that I've attended or whether it's reflective groups that I've sat in on towards the end of the day. And one of the key themes that's coming through constantly about everything is collaboration. And it's, it's been a remarkably consistent element, both in the way people talk about learning with children and young people, and in the way that you talk about learning from and with each other. And related to that, a constant and resolute focus on practice. As a group throughout the day, one of the things that you've done consistently is shown a complete willingness to move from the immediate practical activity, no matter how small and no matter how limited the impact might be to the big idea. And you've actually completely captured Dave Brailsford, the British cycling guy's whole technique of the aggregation of minimal gain. That whole idea about taking small steps and moving them forward to making something bigger and better. But what you're doing all the time is you're informing that with a consistent vision of what's important about learning and what matters in learning. And to go back to one of the things that I was trying to pick up on this morning, it's that transition between the eternal verities of what make a difference in terms of young people's learning and what we can add to that because of what we now know and are enabled to do. And you've done that, I think, consistently throughout the day. I think one of the other things which has been quite remarkable as a theme for the day is coherence. And the coherence theme, I think, comes in several ways. One is your ability to make sense of what is happening. <coughs> And unlike almost any other gathering that I've been engaged in recently where there's been this breadth and width of discussion, you actually understand there is no curriculum for excellence. <laughs> you actually understand that there is no change in significant terms, in terms of curriculum. You understand there is a change in process because you understand what the process is. And that is what gives pedagogy coherence in that sense. It's based on a fundamental understanding of that coherence around learning and taking it forward through engagement, collaboration, and the resolute focus on practice. And the focus is on practice because the focus is on learners. And again, that's one of the wonderful things today is the courtesy and respect that people showed to the two girls from Uphall Primary School and the responses that you got from them as a result. And there's a real sense around, I mean I listened last week and this has been, for all sorts of reasons, this has been an incredibly emotional week for me and in a whole number of ways. But I listened to Ian White at Govan High School on Wednesday talking to this Dutch group that I had. And I was so moved because what he was talking about consistently was a culture of change and learning in the school rooted in care and concern. Rooted in a sense of what mattered and what was important for the young people within that community. And it was that whole idea which I was tweeting about this week and which I mentioned also this morning that now is the time for educators and communities to come together and seize the leadership of educational change. Because what is happening around bureaucrats and politicians will not serve our children well. What you've done consistently throughout the day is put in a challenge to Michael Gove and Michael Wilshaw in England, whose belief is that if you raise the bar, you make the high jump improve. <laughs> <laughs> and it is not how you make progress. You make progress, and again, it's the other consistent theme that comes through the day. You make progress by empowering learners. And time and time and time again, as you've gone through the day, you've talked about that idea of empowering learners. Better than any other group that I've worked with recently, you actually get at the root of the quote that I use constantly that in times of change the learner shall inherit the earth, while the learned will remain beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. But my addition to that, which many of you have probably heard and will be bored hearing, is that we actually need to go further than that. We need to give our learners the power to shape the inheritance that we leave them. 
Because unless we can do that, the inheritance is of little value. It's an inheritance of economic recession and environmental catastrophe. And at times, I think it's an inheritance which under the current coalition is close to moral bankruptcy. And what I think you're trying to do around this is to restore a real sense of what's possible for young people if we can empower them to learn. So that means ambition. And you've shown that constantly. The number of times in these reflection sections that people were talking about what they were going to do next week because of what they care today. The turning circle of many of our teachers in a brilliant session um, in the East Lothian Learning Festival where this teacher asked the question, how can we teach young people resilience? And she went on about that. And in answer to it, I said, let's not be getting up ourselves. <laughs> I said, some of these kids are showing more resilience than we've ever dreamt of. They're showing resilience to come out of homes which are broken, fractured, characterised by poverty, violence, and bankruptcy of ambition and value, and getting to school and making a start at learning. And we've got teachers who go into meltdown because you changed their timetable. <laughs> and I think what we need to recognise is that what you're trying to do as a community is build that sense of collective resilience. People talked in the reflective session about the strength that they drew simply from knowing that they were not alone. You know, that whole concept that you're out there in a world where everybody from Lindsay Patterson to the Daily Record thinks that curriculum for excellence is a recipe for disaster and chaos, and you're out there saying, no, we are responsible. <coughs> nobody today, and I think again it's one of the critical themes of the day, nobody today is prepared to avoid responsibility because of the belief that you have in learners and learning. And when you put yourselves together as a community, Fergal's last question, when you put yourselves together as a community, that's where you gain the energy, strength, capacity and resilience to actually translate that ambition into some kind of reality. And that's been a phenomenal theme coming through. You want to create a culture of critique where youngsters critique each other's work and learn from rehearsal. You want to create a culture of critique where you learn from each other by discussing and evaluating ideas. People today have been open and prepared to open up to others and take the comments, take the criticism, take the feedback because you're in a trusting environment. And what that says about the climate that we need for development in schools is absolutely essential, that we need to move forward on a culture of trust built around the language of literature and poetry and not a culture of threat based on the language of bullying and exposure. And I think far too often that's the kind of thing that we're hearing coming through as people discuss and evaluate the profession. So we're looking at opening up tasks. We're looking at question-led learning. And ultimately we're looking at one of the most beautiful moments of the entire day for me which was in Neil Winton's session where he showed this piece of work that had been put together by a young woman whose early her name was on what is beauty. And it was phenomenal and if you didn't go to the workshop and you didn't see it, you must find a way of accessing it because it is absolutely stunning. And what Neil Winton showed through it was how you explode the experiences and outcomes. How you prevent them from being a checklist that dominates and dictates what we do and becomes instead a springboard for action, but in taking that approach actually covered all the experiences and outcomes. Not only across virtually all disciplines, but virtually across all stages. It's a stunning piece of work. And one of her answers, however, to the question, what is beauty? She said, it is the people who give something back. And that's one of the main things I'm synthesizing for t from today. That you want to characterize yourselves as being the people who give something back. Give something back to children and young people. Give something back to schools and communities. And give something back to each other because it is the least which we deserve. You have set the ambition not to teach science but to educate scientists. Not to teach reading as decoding, 
but his reading is a fundamental gateway to understanding as a means of accessing beauty. You set yourself in what you do, and to do it in a building where above that door it says, we the people stand for idea making, not paper chasing, innovating and not note taking. So let the thoughts flow as freely as the coffee. <laughs> Speak your mind and enjoy. That for me is where we've reached today. A position where people are able to speak their mind and enjoy and find that that which they say from their mind has value and resonance for others. Take that away from today. But the other thing is take that away from today and build on it further. You've made commitments as to what you'll do. My commitment, he said, <coughs> being an insane egoist <laughs> with his own sense of possibility. <laughs> And as soon as I put this leather jacket on, I just go crazy. <laughs> World domination. It, it leads me to dancing and rhythmic gymnastics. <laughs> and all else. Right, my commitment for today is what I want to do is everything that I possibly can to break this out of this ghetto. Because we're here, you're here, reinforcing each other. What we need to do is make the wider change possible. There's a parallel for me between what you're doing through Perigu and Schools of Ambition. Schools of Ambition <coughs> allowed those who are willing to make changes in the best interests of children. And it succeeded because it built exactly on that willingness to make change. But the changes were generally limited to the places which had the funding. Curriculum for Excellence was an effort to try and drive forward the spirit of curriculum, sorry, of Schools of Ambition and move it across and we know that for you to really make change there comes times when you not only need motivation, you need the permissions. And what we need to do I think is to try to pull together an event with colleagues from ADES, colleagues from further education as well, colleagues from higher education and you because until we put together the voices of those who have the wit, willingness, imagination and understanding to make change and those who have the responsibility of leading it, we won't realise the full potential of what you've been beginning to do before today and through today. So that's my commitment, is to try and pull that together and make it happen as best I can. And what I do know is if I can create that <coughs> opportunity along with others, I can find no better colleagues to take advantage of it than the colleagues that I've worked with and met with today. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for all you've given back to me. And please maintain that ambition to find beauty in being the people who give something back. Thanks very much. <laughs>